coming. My name is Tim Lorden. I'm the Executive Director for the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. This is the third in our series on legislating uh, online child safety. Uh, what we wanted to do with uh, a three-part series was look at some of the legislative proposals uh, designed to try to keep kids safe online, uh, a paramount issue, obviously. And uh, we have done, this is our third event. The first one was on web labeling provision to keep kids away from sexually explicit material. The second one was on age verification and kids using social networking sites. Um, this last one, interestingly, um, focuses on the privacy implications of a concept called uh, data retention. The name of our event is called Warehousing Consumers Online Travels to Catch Child Predators and Terrorists and the Privacy Implications Thereof. Um, throughout the 10-year history of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, there's been a strong vein of looking at the privacy implications of, of legislation and uh, associated uh, Internet technology. So it's, it's, not a, it's very, uh, the strong precedent that we would look at the privacy implications of any, any proposal and also the privacy implications of just general industry practice. I mean, that goes back um, 10 years. Um, let me just make a comment with regard to the um, the privacy implications. No one, I think, in the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee is alleging that uh, or saying that uh, protecting children uh, online from predators or even catching terrorists isn't uh, of the utmost importance. Um, uh, we were amazed as we were planning this entire series the length to which our Internet Caucus Advisory Committee members, uh, companies, nonprofits, uh, universities, uh, uh, trade associations, the lengths they've gone to try to keep kids safe online and educate consumers and parents uh, with regard to those issues. Um, we have put together a briefing book uh, of one-pagers of all the different efforts that many Internet Caucus Advisory Committee members are doing to try to keep kids safe online, and that wasn't part of your handout materials that, that you received when, when you came in. So I would direct your attention to that um, as evidence of the, the lengths that folks have gone through um, to try to address uh, these issues and get some education out there. Um, the issue today, as I said, is on data retention. Um, it's, it's kind of a complex issue. Um, there's a lot of different terms that may be foreign to you. But let me just, if I may, before I get to our panel, who is now all assembled, thank God, um, on what data retention is. Uh, data retention essentially is the, the process by, what inter by which internet communications and associated transactional data is retained by an internet provider the information they keep, uh, typically for all of their customers. Now, the extent to which these companies voluntarily retain this information, um, it, it varies. The, the types of information, the types of content, um, different companies retain different types of data sets for different periods of time. Um, and this is all voluntary. Some keep them for you know, months, some keep them for longer periods of time, and some don't keep them at all. Um, with regard to the issue today, is government mandated data retention? The question is if the federal government would require uh, that these companies retain certain classes of information for a set period of time for all of their customers, and that would be a federal requirement. Um, I think it's, it's hard. We would pre presumably, it would be we don't know the scope of the legislation because there's a variety of different bills. We don't know what's going to actually happen. But it could be transactional information, you know, when, when a customer logged on, who they, what servers and computers they communicated with, uh, for how long did they log on for, um, that type of information. It could also, for all we know, end up being the types of content um, uh, to be retained, the, the content of the maybe email messages or instant messages or um, the types of websites that they went to. Um, and I also, another differentiation we should make is mandated government, uh, ma government mandated data retention is a little bit different than a concept called data preservation. Data preservation is where under law, under existing law, um, law enforcement can go to any internet service provider and request that um, they retain information up to 90 days on a specific customer. Um, while they go back and build a case and get the proper search warrants to get at that information. And that can be renewed after that 90 days for another 90 days and so on and so on. That's called data preservation. Um, and that's, that's under existing federal law. Um, there's also another law that's kind of similar where it's called um, a mandatory notification for child pornography. Uh, under federal law, if a ISP becomes aware of child pornography on its networks, it's required to report that to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, who then refer it to law enforcement, make the determination whether it is indeed child porn, and then uh, submit that to the, the proper authorities, law enforcement, uh, presumably the Department of Justice. 
Um, the technical terms, I guess, uh, data retention would be, as I said, transactional information. Um, and again, maybe content. Um, and I think it bears noting how, how did we get here? Um, the Department of Justice's Attorney General, uh, Alberto Gonzalez, has called for Congress to look at and implement a data retention regime to catch pedophiles and, um, and, and possibly terrorists. Um, Congress, Congressman Chairman Sensenbrenner from the Judiciary Committee in the House has introduced legislation on, on keeping records. Uh, Congresswoman De DeJet from, from Colorado has introduced a similar provision. We did expect the House Commerce Committee to introduce a, a piece of legislation before they adjourned, but they did not. Um, the, probably the, uh, the other, the conversely, um, we do have legislation introduced in the House by Congressman Markey that takes an opposite tack. It says uh, for some companies they should be required to delete types of information, uh, presumably search engines and the searches that people perform. So on the one side we have uh, legislation that would require certain types of information to be retained. On the other, we have um, le legislation that would require deletion of information. I just read today there was a California initiative by a nonprofit group that they want to get on the ballot in California uh, a referendum that would require, again, um, certain companies to delete uh, types of consumer information. The backdrop we've seen since February of 2005 um, is about a year and a half of just a lot of different, uh, we've read them in the headlines, data breaches, um, sensitive personal information being lost, whether it be laptops left in, in taxi cabs or uh, inside jobs where uh, consumer information was revealed. The privacy information, the privacy, uh, uh, the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse, which is a nonprofit in California, has tracked on its website all the different data breaches um, over the, since the February of, of 2005, and they estimate that over 93 million records, customer records, um, have been exposed to data breaches um, in the past uh, since February 2005. The most interesting um, aspect of this debate is, um, is framed by a letter uh, from the National Association of Attorney Generals, signed by 49 out of 50 state attorney generals. Uh, we actually asked the National Association of Attorney Generals to be here on the panel today, but they were not able to do that. Um, but with 49 out of 50 state AGs um, calling for some type of federal standard uh, for data retention, it, it, it bears looking at. Um, and let me just read a little bit of the, um, the Attorney General's letter. Um, they noted that it would be premature to make a recommendation as to the duration and type of content that should be retained. However, they put on the table questions like what type of data should be stored, should different types of data or content have different retention standards, and whether different types of ISPs should be held to, a, held to different standards. And, so that sets the stage, I think, for the conversation today. We've assembled a, a panel of experts from, from you know, the left, the right, and, and pretty much right in the center, um, representing uh, nonprofits, civil liberties, and, and even I ISPs for that matter. Um, let me introduce them in turn. Uh, I'd like to introduce first Jim Halpert, who is co-chair of the communications, e-commerce, and privacy practice of DLA uh, Piper, which is a, a large law firm here in the city. Um, Jim has years of experience working with ISPs on privacy-related matters and also intellectual property issues. Um, on a personal note, Jim Halpert, if any of you watch the show The Office, there's a character on The Office called Jim Halpert. Jim is actually the uh, inspiration for that character. So I thought with him showing up late, it was some kind of practical joke that the character would play. Um, wasn't very funny in my estimation. But um, with regard... <laughs> so, so Jim, let me just ask you, um, let's go to Jim first. What are the privacy applications for uh, mandatory data retention versus what we currently have? Um, what w I think a lot of it depends on what information is retained and uh, how extensively the data retention mandate applies. If you look, um, as most of the proposals do, at retaining IP addresses, currently there's a, most of the broadband providers retain IP address information for a, you know, fairly considerable period of time. Um, it just tells you who's logged on and off the Internet at a, at a particular time. But if you start to extend that IP address assignment information uh, mandate to narrowband providers that assign many more IP addresses for many more different types of applications, or you, you uh, apply an IP address data retention mandate in a world where people are offering new sorts of VoIP services or even video services, all of a sudden the amount of information that's, that has to be retained expands uh, significantly. Also, if, if the IP address assignment 
um, uh, IP addresses get assigned at lots of different levels from a website that a consumer visits that will assign an IP address uh, back to the actual point of login. If all the way through the chain of how a consumer got to a particular website you have a data retention mandate, then it's certainly possible to uh, go back and trace how users are uh, navigating their way around the internet and that gets to information that essentially becomes contents because it traces what websites you're visiting and or what sort of uh, way that you chose to reach a particular website. So a lot of the devil here is in the details. Also the burden that's associated with this will be in the details of what who would be required to retain the IP addresses and for what sorts of applications. Okay. Um, our next panelist is David Sobel, who is the senior counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a nonprofit organization that seeks to protect the constitutional rights and civil liberties in the electronic age. Uh, bef um, before that, David was uh, along with the Electronic Privacy Information Center uh, here in the city. Um, he has litigated numerous cases regarding uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, requests, FOIA, uh, seeking the disclosure of government documents uh, on privacy policy, including electronic surveillance and encryption tools. David, if I could just ask you, what are the you know kind of the privacy implications you see of some of the data retention proposals being put forward here? Well, I. I think in addition to privacy implications, which Thank you. <laughs> I think in addition to the privacy implications, we we also need to talk about some closely associated uh, to privacy, which um, we don't always think about in this context. But it's also First Amendment rights of expression. Um, the Supreme Court has uh, rec long recognized that there is a right to communicate anonymously and we need to remember when we're talking about data retention that we're talking about imposing these requirements on a communications medium. Um, so I, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, the constitutional issues here are not only privacy issues that might arise under the Fourth Amendment but free expression issues that arise under the First Amendment as well. So I, I just wanted to get that out on the table to um, make clear that um, you know there there is are, are really a range of um, constitutional issues um, and issues in terms of the kind of society we see ourselves as being and the kind of communications infrastructure uh, that that we want to build um, in terms of specific privacy expectations and again I raised constitutional issues so I, I think I, I need to say uh, that we're talking about a kind of uh, information that the Supreme Court has in the past um, not recognized as uh, being deserving of Fourth Amendment protection. Uh, in, in a series of cases um, in, in the 1970s uh, that I disagree with, and I think uh, even in, in light of the modern world, uh, they are even less defensible now than they were then. But the court basically said that uh, when an individual places information in the hands of a third party, that they no longer have an expectation of privacy in that information and that as a result law enforcement does not need to obtain a search warrant uh, to access that information. That doesn't mean it's free and clear and free for the taking. Um, statutory provisions require different levels of some authorization whether it's a subpoena or a court order uh, but not a full-blown search warrant based on probable cause. So, so I think we need to recognize the fact that the legal status of this material based on some of those old, old decisions um, is not as strong as some of us would like it to be. Um, but I, I think when you talk about expectations of privacy, it's not only a question of, of legal um, decisions and what the Supreme Court might have said 30 years ago. We also, obviously, in a political environment like the Congress, need to think about what the average person's expectation really is. And I think the average person using the Internet does have a sense of privacy and anonymity. And when detailed information about what they're doing online ends up being disclosed, the people affected are usually very surprised that the technology allows that kind of tracing of uh, and, and tracking of their activities. And I think 
the, the perfect example was a recent one when America Online, um, either advertently or inadvertently, depending how you look at it, released uh, millions of search histories um, generated through its search engine. Um, this information was supposedly anonymous. It didn't contain identifying information, the names of particular subscribers. But what we saw was that the when you provide someone with enough details of what a person is looking at and what they're doing online, it's really not that difficult to identify that person and learn a lot about uh, the intimate aspects of their lives. So for instance, the New York Times was able, using the material that AOL had disclosed, to specifically identify um, a, an elderly woman um, and contacted her, and she was shocked th that when, when her search terms were read back to her by a New York Times reporter. So I, I think it's important that we don't lose sight of the expectation that people actually have when, when they're using the technology. And unfortunately, and this gets back to uh, the, the, the flip side of this that, that Tim alluded to in, in talking about legislation that's been proposed to actually restrict the amount of information that's being collected by, by online service providers. Um, the industry, industry practice right now seems to be to collect as much as possible and to keep it for, a long as, for as long as possible um, for commercial reasons. And in reaction to that, several months ago, Congressman Markey introduced legislation that would restrict the ability of search engine companies to retain uh, large amounts of, of search data for long periods of time. So, I, I think we need to look at this issue in a balanced way that, yes, there are some law enforcement interests in having access to more information, but there are also very significant privacy interests. And as far as the law enforcement interest is concerned, you know, my reaction is, well, of course, law enforcement always wants access to as much information as they can possibly get their hands on. But my reading of the Bill of Rights is that the job of law enforcement is not always supposed to be as easy as it might, be, might otherwise be. There, there do need to be obstacles and hurdles that law enforcement needs to get over in order to protect individual rights. So I, I, I think we need to look at it in that balanced way. Well, Jim, uh, I want to introduce uh, Jim Harper, who's next, which sound, his name sounds an awful lot like Jim Halpert, so I'm going to apologize for <laughs> uh, say, <laughs> sc screwing those up um, during the course of this discussion. But Jim, Jim Harper is the Director of Information Studies at the Cato Institute, which is a, a conservative civil, uh, libertarian think tank up on Massachusetts Avenue here. Um, Jim is also a member of the Department of Homeland Security's Data, Privacy, and Integrity Advisory Committee. Um, Jim has hosts a website called privacylaw.org, which looks at the privacy issues related to some of these issues uh, in the digital age. And as far as I can tell, you know, you're, you're, there's no television characters that are modeled after you, um, particularly. No, no uh, except for on real stories of the Highway Patrol. But uh, that, was, that was a youthful, youthful indiscretion. Uh, thank you, Tim, for having me here. Thank all of you for being here. And I, I do want to express my, express my pleasure at being here with Jim Halpert because it's proof that we're actually two separate people. That's right. <laughs> occasionally, I, I think occasionally we get each other's phone calls and have interesting conversations with people um, who think we're the other. I, I suppose I, I'm ready to broker a compromise um, between the government's schizophrenic views on whether there should be mandated data retention or mandated uh, data destruction, and that would be perhaps to leave well enough alone. Um, but, but perhaps that's a little too glib and too simplistic. Um, like David did, and I endorse everything he said about the Fourth Amendment issues, I think the thing to do here is to start at the beginning. Uh, when I came to Washington and went to work in Congress, uh, it, was, it was 1995, a very special time in Congress and and there was a requirement put in the House rules at least to have a statement of constitutional authority in all legislation and that's the kind of the kind of steps that I go through when I think about uh, legal proposals like this and I've asked myself looking at data retention what's the constitutional authority what on earth is the is the the grant of power in the Constitution that allows the federal Congress to instruct businesses to maintain records for the purposes of law enforcement Best argument is the Commerce Clause, which gives the federal government power to make regular commerce among the states, and it's almost incoherent to try to use that power to, uh, to argue for a data retention mandate. 
The other part of the constitutional step is, of course, to look at constitutional limitations on action. And again, David, I think, covered them well, the Fourth Amendment questions. Uh, the, the Supreme Court law on, on data held by third parties is very bad. It's very disagreeable. And, and David's understated and, and calm, but you people should be outraged and you'd be surprised to know what the legal status is of information that you pass through third parties or to third parties. Uh, basically, the general rule is you've given up your Fourth Amendment privacy claims about that, and the government can come can come grab it using very low legal standards, if any legal standards at all. And the more we move online, we're only at the beginning of the information age, the more we move our lives online, the more out of step with reality uh, current Supreme Court Fourth Amendment law will become. So um, obviously a, a data retention mandate would take advantage of that that deep fissure between the Supreme Court law and, and people's expectations, but that's not a reason why it should go forward. The next steps, obviously, are to think through the reasons for and the reasons why not to do data retention. And uh, again, David stated well that, yes, as a general matter, law enforcement and national security always do better with more information. But that's far too general to be useful. Uh, it's, it's actually needed information that is relevant. It's, it's actually information that applies to particular situations that's useful. And I think there's a, there's a habit in, in the federal government. I do a lot of work watching the DHS, but certainly I think this probably exists at the Justice Department, to say, hey, if we just had more data, if we just had more information, we'd, we'd be able to do more. But that isn't always true. In fact, sometimes it's, it's precisely the opposite. The utility of data really comes from its relevance. And so the Fourth Amendment is not just a constitutional rule, it's also a pragmatic rule that you should get evidence about things that matter rather than collecting or requiring others to collect information about a broad, a broad swath of Americans' communications activities. There are, there's, go ahead, did you have a question? Um, there are arguments uh, in, in favor of data retention, but I think they're essentially dispelled a variety of ways. Jim Dempsey at the Center for Democracy and Technology is probably the best exponent of the idea that the digital world makes more access, uh, more information accessible to law enforcement than ever before. Uh, do not countenance the argument that law enforcement is, is being put back by digital technology because computers, networks, and caches of all kinds collect lots of information. And again, it's, this information is more accessible than ever before. Um, as Tim mentioned, data preservation requirements already exist. Targeted data pres preservation makes much more sense than a broad uh, data retention mandate. And as Jim Halpert uh, alluded to and talked about, ISPs do retain information for their own business purposes. David mentioned that as well. It's controversial, and, and there should be constant discussion about how much information is kept and for how long. But, uh, but there's already data there. You have to be way behind the eight ball as, a, as law enforcement to think that, that you can't get to the information you need. If you're way late coming to an investigation, the, the data might be gone. But if you're hot on the trail of somebody, you'll be able to get the data uh, from ISPs. Jim, let me just interrupt. If, if I could just ask Jim Halpert, um, whether or not, would you agree with that assessment that the digital, this new digital age we're in and all the electronic communications that we have have actually been a boon to law enforcement because there's so much, so much more of a trail of, of digital information. I think from the perspective of investigating offenses, yes, there's more evidence that's created and preserved um, because if you think about having a, con if, if away from the television cameras and the microphones, we had a conversation, um, there would be no record at all of the contents of that communication, but if people are emailing or even communicating by IM or otherwise over the internet or posting on some sort of chat room, there is a location where evidence is preserved and becomes accessible to law enforcement. And um, dumb cyber criminals make the assumption that they are anonymous online and they will be caught. People who know are sophisticated and want to evade any sort of, of tracing can use various mechanisms to do that. And in a world of IP address data retention, such as we're talking about today, they would still be able to do that. But the, the, the uh, 
dumb criminal today generally can be caught, and in a world of IP address data retention, will uh, still be able to be caught. But um, the question is, what other information, or that we're, we'll then be storing information about the 99.99 percent of Americans who are not committing the sort of crimes that we're we're talking about today, will mandate that that be stored, even if there's no business reason or legitimate reason that a, a provider would see for keeping the information. And uh, we also would be overlooking the data preservation system, which focuses on the 0.001 percent of Internet users who are suspected of committing an offense. And under those circumstances, law enforcement can send a simple letter to any ISP, and the ISP is supposed to, is required by law, to then preserve evidence, all sorts of evidence, not only IP address assignment information, but also contents of communication and business records that relate to that individual. So that this data preservation mechanism gives you more information if you're a law enforcement official and gives it about particularized people who are suspected of committing offenses rather than about the whole world of Internet users. Jim, let me, you just brushed over a term, uh, IP addresses. Can you distinguish, um, just because it's a technical term? I'm sorry. Can you distinguish, no, it's Okay, can you distinguish between IP addresses and um, transactional information and the maybe perhaps content of communications? Sure. An IP address is a number that is assigned to your computer, either by a web website or by the internet service provider that you log on, log on to. And that, that number identifies you simply by the number. It needs to be traced back to account information for the ISP that gave you connectivity or some other uh, that, that can then match the, the IP address that they've assigned to you to your customer account or otherwise by a website that if you signed up, for example, and registered at the website, gave them a profile and they assigned an IP address related to that. But it's a number that stands for the machine that you use to go access the Internet. It also, uh, there's some limitations to that. Uh, you could have multiple people using the same machine or if you think about it, uh, I don't know how many of you uh, or people in, who are watching on TV have ever used a, a, a wireless access on their laptop and logged on to somebody else's uh, 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 Wi-Fi network. But when you do that, the IP address that's assigned to you is that of the Wi-Fi network, not of uh, one that's really specific to your network. So you could have multiple users that appear to be using the same um, uh, I, uh, the same IP address that's assigned by the Internet access provider. Also, and this adds an additional layer of complexity, there are some services that currently don't assign any IP address at all. If you go to a school or library, you're probably not going to get an IP address assigned to you. Most Internet users at any given time are not using a commercial ISP or it's roughly about 50-50. A lot of people at, who are at work who are logging on to the internet or people who are working, uh, say, serving in the armed forces who will access government computers and, and, and go to the internet. So the, the IP address assignment uh, data retention debate really misses a whole lot of the the real issues about how you were to, if you wanted to trace people who are using the internet uh, who might be committing uh, illegal activities, um, looking at commercial ISPs is only about half the story and you're really missing a whole lot of stuff that the government, um, which typically is looking to impose these mandates, if you look at all the state AGs who signed this letter, they're proposing that commercial ISPs face this obligation, not state governments, where, where, which they serve and they represent. And it's sometimes funny when you have this, you represent industry players, you're, the, the industry can be asked to do various things, but the government isn't always asked to do it, and the industry can also be asked to do conflicting things. And you've just heard David speak saying ISPs should have to, or internet companies should have to destroy information. Um, and essentially companies will, will keep this information for business purposes um, that, uh, for example, for making sure that customers are getting good quality of service, that their connectivity wasn't interrupted. There are various reasons why IP addresses are useful. Um, but if you have mandates to, and, and Europe actually works this way, to. Uh, first of all, destroy the information, but then you have a specific mandate to keep the information. You get into a very regulatory universe that can interfere with, with ways that, uh, uh, with good business practices that companies want to pursue. So, well, since, you, since you mentioned Europe, um, I, sh I should note, and I didn't in my opening, that uh, in Europe there is a, a data director, a data directive across uh, the union uh, for data, re data retention. 
Um, the EU data um, retention policy goes out to its member states and they, each of the states, the country and the European Union has to implement um, a standard for data retention. Um, the, the guidelines are from the European Union. But they have to retain information like the data necessary to trace the identity of the source, data necessary to trace the identity of the destination, et cetera, et cetera. And there's an interesting one at the bottom where data necessary to identify the location of mobile communication equipment. Um, and this could be up to a year or two years. So but does that mean that you'd have to retain where you lo every time you logged on to a cell phone, what cell you were on, what geographic location you're on? Is that? Well, I mean, in fact, given the technology, at least in the United States, that has been mandated by the government, since we're talking about uh, government mandates, um, for E911 purposes with cellular communications, in order to ensure that the location of a cell phone that dials a 911 call can really be pinpointed, um, the government has required the providers to uh, really narrow down that location information. So, so now that that capability is being built into the network and mandated, uh, increasingly is going to be even more precise than nearest cell tower, but um, within, within a block or so of the actual location. Jim? Tim, let me, let me encourage everyone to, to also take the long view because there are, are, there's what's happening now and, the, and the, propo the proposals that are being floated around now about data retention and legitimate concerns about, about the natural equilibrium uh, retention of, of information in the commercial sector. But over the long haul, it's nearly a guarantee if there's a data retention mandate that it will see mission creep and likely along two dimensions. That the first dimension is that is that whatever data is 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 mandatorily retained at the outset, the scope will expand. So you may go to just collecting IP information and then some greater identity or transactional information some more content information, and before too long, you have a serious surveillance system operating on all of us. The other dimension by which it's, which it's likely to extend is um, in terms of new purposes. The proposals are, are put forward as strictly related to child pornography or child endangerment, strictly related to terrorism, national security. Those flimsy barriers against government action will fall away in no time on a, if you're looking down the horizon and the the data retention mandate will will the data retained will be used for all kinds of investigations and more and more every the the, the dominant theme in my public policy thinking about the information age is that it's pulling all of us out of practical obscurity where things we do disappear from memory they disappear the f facts and data about us disappear all the time in, in the real world, and that's appropriate. And we we got, build our lives consistent with that. We're being pulled out of practical obscurity. More information about us is being known to everyone. The last thing we want to do is have the government pushing that process forward and making the data available to itself because law enforcement will switch from from pursuing criminals and pursuing crime to pursuing people. I don't want to be the guy 10 years from now who cuts off someone in traffic who works for the Department of Justice or DHS because they'll say, that guy must have done something wrong. Let's go figure out what it was. The incentive structure for law enforcement is changing and will change if we have data retention mandates because they'll be inclined to investigate people rather than crimes. Jim Halpert. Um, one other point that I think is worth making here is that if the I, if the even an IP address data retention mandate is drawn too broadly, the primary users of that information are not going to be law enforcement in the end. There are an awful lot of civil litigants in really nasty cases who, for example, a divorce case or an employment case where, where say, an employee is suing an empl a former employer, um, uh, cases of involving um, allegations of copyright infringement where tracing back and identifying what somebody did online becomes uh, useful. And if the information is mandated to be retained, unless it's specifically protected 
from uh, discovery in, in uh, civil litigation proceedings, it's just out there and it, it, people will know that, that it's there and uh, people in, in private lawsuits can then go and dig up, uh, try and trace back and dig, dig up uh, information about people's web usage and, and internet usage. And uh, when we talk about, it, it, when, whenever we have a discussion like this about a, a, a law enforcement need, there are extraordinarily compelling law enforcement needs. I'm here speaking just on my own personal behalf, not on behalf of any clients, and I can t tell you that I'm very, very sympathetic to um, the specific uh, kind of horror stories that are thrown up, but then there isn't a, a discussion about how will the information actually be used in the overwhelming majority of cases, and I think it's important to find an appropriate balance here, and uh, to a large extent, I think the private sector has already done that. Um, and stands ready to work with law enforcement and assist law enforcement, but imposing um, a, a mandate that could then be used for all these unintended consequences is something that really deserves very careful attention and uh, thinking also in terms of what's the most cost-effective uh, way to help law enforcement to pursue these cases, just focusing myopically on IP address data retention without looking at a whole lot of other ways that the private sector, for example, or government can assist law enforcement in pursuing various cases, I think is to, to miss a much larger story about trying how we best find cyber criminals. David? And I also, along those lines, want to underscore something that's already been mentioned, uh, which, which is that law enforcement today is not without tools. There, there is and there has been for a long time in federal law the ability to order the preservation, as, as Jim mentioned earlier, of information concerning a particular individual. Um, so it doesn't require probable cause. It requires some indication that there is a person whose activities are of sufficient interest to law enforcement to at least preliminarily ask the service provider to preserve that information if they wouldn't otherwise be keeping it in the, in the course of their own business practices. Now, I, I think it's, it's interesting to go back a few years, and um, for many years there was a treaty being negotiated uh, within the Council of Europe, which the United States government was very involved in, um, in, in, in negotiating. It, this was the so-called Cybercrime Treaty, which uh, was just recently entered into by the United States. It was very controversial for several, for, for several years during its negotiation because one of the concerns, particularly in this country, was that the cybercrime treaty might be read to require data, preser data retention. And the Department of Justice went to very great lengths for a number of years to insist upon the adequacy uh, of the existing data preservation provisions, uh, saying that those provisions were adequate, that the United States government did not have any interest in requiring data retention. Um, so I, I think the record that we have in front of us um, in terms of actual experience in using the legal regime we have is that the Justice Department has until very recently uh, maintained for a long time that data preservation is entirely adequate. Well, let me, um, if I may, uh, if the audience will indulge me for just one more question, then we'll go to audience Q&A if, if, if you have any questions. Um, we, I had talked in my opening about the 93 million records that have been spilled since February of 2005, and, and I do believe that that kind of colors this debate with regard to database, databases being held about consumers. Um, what I find interesting is that we have all, and these new internet companies, some of which are the most popular sites on the internet, were just created within a matter of months ago, um, not even a year ago, and some of them are being created in people's garages. Um, if we have a requirement to keep data for periods of time, whether it's IP addresses, transactional information, or even content, what is the wherewithal um, of these small startup, you know, duct tape uh, and, and glue type uh, uh, websites to safeguard that data and make sure it's secure and, and not sub su subject to spill? Well, I'll, uh, Jim Halpert's comments, I think, put put that question in, in a broader perspective. Retained data is a, is an attractive nuisance in a way 
think of it as something that people are going to do stuff with uh, beyond beyond the law enforcement purpose for which it's collected. It'll be used by litigants. They'll go in and say, hey, you've, you've got data about this. It also creates security problems. The existence, keeping valuable information around is a, is a security problem. If you don't have to keep it, don't keep it. Get rid of it. It's on the cost side of the ledger for, for ISPs and other, other data providers right now. And the security risks from holding this data are great. Uh, they, they go along with the cost of maintaining data. Now, the, the cost of, of holding on to data computing power is constantly going down. But at scale, when you're talking about petabytes and terabytes of information, it gets to be a large cost. And we're talking about a, a mandate on the private sector to conduct surveillance on behalf of law enforcement. Okay. Um, if there are any audience questions, um, ma'am? I don't think there's necessarily a, a, a dichotomy that it's an either-or choice. I mean, IP address retention is one of many, many different ways um, to be able to um, trace and, and address uh, problems of child luring on the Internet. Um, there, the number one way to, to address child luring on the Internet, to my mind, is to provide very, very clear um, uh, education to kids and parents about this problem, because the, the, if you're dealing with data retention, you're dealing after the fact, after some tragedy has occurred, and uh, educating uh, uh, both teenagers and parents, and in fact, including curriculum on this, as Virginia's done in the schools, is a, first of all, an initial, probably more effective way, a much more effective way to deal with the problem. There also are ways to require reporting of known incidents of of child luring, which is currently not required under under uh, federal law, there are ways to make the data preservation system work more efficiently. To, um, uh, for example, require that when it, when a report happens to the National Center for Missing and Exploiting Children, which is mandated by ISPs for child pornography. Um, that information related to that report is preserved automatically. This is the practice of many larger ISPs, but smaller ISPs aren't, aren't necessarily aware of this and doing this. So there are, there are a host of different ways, also training and providing other forms of assistance to law enforcement to uh, pursue these sorts of, of, of cases when they occur. Um, there are lots and lots of different responses to this problem. This is just one of them. And then the question also becomes what's being required in any sort of mandate. And that's an, uh, just another question that, that comes up. So it's not an either-or choice. I think David had a comment. Yeah, I mean, I think the recent case to which I think you're alluding um, certainly, you know, demonstrates the correctness, I, I think, of, of what we've been saying, which is that in most of these cases, there is likely to be enough particularized suspicion about a particular person um, that once that comes to the attention of the authorities, there are adequate provisions for preservation of that person's communications. Now, there seems to be some dispute as to how long ago there was reason to be suspicious um, in this case, but clearly it, it sounds as if there was enough time uh, to take appropriate steps to document whatever activities uh, might have been occurring that might have been a concern. So I, I think it's an illustration of the fact that existing current law would have been adequate if the appropriate steps had been taken in that case. Jim? I think it's important to step back and look at the look at the policy issues from a, the big picture perspective to the parents who are saying that that this kind of thing can protect their children the federal government cannot will not and should not replace parents in protecting children i can't be more emphatic about that and politicians who come forward and say we're going to we're going to protect your children this way they're giving false hope to parents who should be stepping up themselves again and again i say it put the computer in the living room talk to your kids. The kinds of, these are the kinds of things that protect them. There is not a one-stop, all-encompassing protection that any government, especially the federal government, can provide. 
Well, um, and let me just make a, a final comment with regard to, I think you were alluding to a, um, a parental education and what do you say to parents. Um, I think the, the case you're referring to, um, you know, we were, I mean, we're trying to think about this and, and we don't have all the facts, obviously. What we read in the world of the newspapers and the headlines um, cannot be necessarily relied on. But what I would say to parents is that, um, sadly, um, if we try to reframe, if we try to frame this incident or sets of incidents as um, an online um, luring or an online um, uh, sexual exploitation of children, we really miss the, miss the mark here. It, it, from what we can tell, and again I'm speculating from the newspapers, is that this incident occurred, these incidents occurred um, in an offline setting which sadly and tragically um, happens in the vast majority of sexual exploitation cases. Um, statistically speaking, children are far more likely to be abused by a family member or someone in a trust relationship um, that they have in a, a proximate uh, physical world um, than they will from an internet predator. So this really shouldn't be um, contextualized um, as an internet predator case. Um, I think we'd miss a really good opportunity for um, parental education if we were to do that. But parents have to realize that um, people close to their children physically and maybe even just horrifically within the same family um, could be the source of uh, um, ill intentions. Tim, I, I think it's also important to point out that in this, this case we're alluding to, uh, information is more available because of, of digitization, right? What other, what other case, what case 20 years ago did you have the actual, uh, actual transcript of what went on between two people? None. And that's without a data retention mandate. Uh, a lot of people like to blame the Internet, but it's a medium of expression, and it actually naturally preserves information better than other media. Uh, part of what I, what I, uh, would have liked to say, had I had two hours to spend with you, uh, is, is that we're talking about imposing a surveillance mandate on a particular form of media. But let's talk about data retention, if we're going to talk about data retention, and not just pick out the online media for it. There are cameras at every hotel and 7-Eleven and in every bank ATM, and that data is just there. It's just there. Why shouldn't law enforcement require all these institutions with these cameras to retain that data in the event that it, it, it serves uh, some use in a later investigation. I don't give them any ideas. <laughs> um, Stop there. Ma'am, you had a question and I'll go over here. Um, a couple things are important, and then I'll hand it to Jim Halpert, who's, who's probably better on the industry, industry government cooperation. First, I think it's very important to get these things in perspective. You use the term exponentially. Now, now it, it may have grown exponentially for a period of time, but an exponential curve goes up to infinity very quickly, and I think it's easy to overstate the scope of this problem. A serious problem, let there be no doubt, but... Sure, sure. And the, the experts are the experts are entirely given to hyperbole to make the case for what they want to do, and the Justice Department loves to use that hyperbole to do what they want to do. But let's all get this in perspective. The the case we've alluded to recently is is boorish and gross behavior, but in Washington D.C., people are trying to outbid each other in terms of horror, right? Bad behavior, of course, but it's it it wasn't horrific as far as we know at this point. But no one was physically harmed. So let's keep that in perspective and the child pornography and child endangerment problem in perspective as well. 
it is not growing exponentially. It's growing just like all online activity is growing, but as a percentage of online activity, it's probably not growing at all. So what we're talking about is collecting information about all the good people, collecting information about all of us, and invading our privacy in order to get at the very, very small number of people who are doing, doing things that I agree entirely are very bad. Jim Halpert, can I ask you to comment on the industry cooperation and what is being done to, to address this problem? Well, the, in, in, large ISPs do an enormous amount of work to actively assist law enforcement in pursuing these cases. They report cases. Some ISPs go around and do training for, for law enforcement agencies at the state level, for example, uh, to, who aren't as familiar with how to conduct cyber investigations so that they can get data quickly. Um, they also are voluntarily preserving uh, data when they become aware of a suspected child pornography incident or anybody tips them off to that, they're saving evidence already so that it's there when law enforcement wants it and saving much more than the IP address login information. But that's in a case of individualized suspicion. Uh, in dealing with child pornography, there's a huge problem with other countries not taking uh, the crime of child pornography seriously. And there's an awful lot of work that needs to be done at the international level so that this becomes a top priority as it should be to protect children. There also are, are technical solutions that internet companies have pledged to work on to uh, curb and, and prevent peer-to-peer -peer sharing of child pornography images. So that there's work on many, many different fronts. It's not, this is probably the number one problem that ISPs focus on with respect to use of their networks. Anybody who does this, they're reporting them to law enforcement. They want them to go to jail. They're packaging up cases to bring to law enforcement. But by the same token, um, it's important to look holistically at how we really solve this problem instead of picking one little fix. If you're, if, you're, if you're a law enforcement agency, for example, and you have not brought a lot of cases, it's a very easy thing for you to do to say, well, you know, if people retain more data, data we bring more cases. But there may be other things, that, and there are other things, that um, can be done to arm AG's offices so that they can bring more cases and they can bring them more quickly. And uh, as we look at this problem, I mean, one, of the, one of the issues, I think, is, is to make sure that all ISPs are preserving evidence proactively where they know of a suspected child pornography incident. There also uh, is uh, work that can be done on the investigative side to find people who are sharing this information. Um, there, there are a host of different um, investigative techniques that can work here and continue to work here. Right now there are more referrals though to uh, law enforcement of child pornography cases, far more than cases that are actually brought, even where the IP address assignment information has been preserved. And we need to look holistically at how we're going to uh, increase the number of prosecutions. It's very easy to say, well, if we had more evidence, if you're law enforcement, we will bring more cases. And that certainly is true, but there are also all sorts of other variables that will permit law enforcement to bring more cases. And I, just focusing on this one narrow issue, ultimately would, would be something of a, of a Pyrrhic victory if, if this is all that was done to solve the child pornography problem, because there are many, many different things on many, many different fronts that can be done to protect children and to, to pursue these really heinous crimes. Well, let me just say, um, with regard to the National Association of Attorneys General, I'm, I'm sorry they couldn't be with us today. Um, the fellow who works on this issue um, uh, at the staff level at the National Association is um, Nick Alexander, um, and he's very approachable, very good guy, um, and he's working very hard on these issues. Issues. Um, I would also say that you had mentioned um, the incidence of child pornography uh, growing exponentially, but also you'd, at the end you'd mentioned um, uh, sexual solicitation of children online um, as well. Um, we were surprised to see this summer the release of a, a, a follow-up study um, by the Internet Crimes Against Children Research Center at the University of New Hampshire. It was commissioned by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and it followed up from a 2000, year 2000 study. Uh, we were surprised that the online sexual solicitation of, of, of children actually decreased from 2000. So you would think that from the headlines, this this is growing exponentially, but with regard to sexual solicitation of children online, at least what they're reporting, is that it's actually less than um, year 2000. Right, and I did distinguish between child pornography and, uh, I can't really speak to the statistics there, but um, with regard to solicitation, um, we have seen, a, uh, according to that study, which is landmark, a, a decrease. Um, yes, sir. Uh, 
let me try to repeat the question for the cameras. Um, I guess the question was, it didn't seem like there's a whole lot of opposition to this type of legislation. Um, do you see any, any chance of influencing its course um, in focusing on um, the costs and burdens upon ISPs and the like? I think at this point, well, first of all, I, I should say that, that uh, there are a, a few ISPs, not the majority, who can live with most data retention um, uh, man, mandates that would be, be that, that we've seen circulated so far in terms of draft legislation. There has been no formal bill introduced uh, mandating data retention, so I think it's very premature to predict um, how legislation would move. The, de the devil is always in the details, and um, what's, we've heard a whole bunch of variables here. What sort of uh, data would be retained for how long? Um, what sort of entities would be required to retain the data? Would there be uses uh, for other purposes beyond the ones that are specifically mentioned as the justification for the legislation? Uh, what other techniques would, would perhaps be more uh, effective than data retention to solve a particular problem? So this debate has really been occurring in, at a level of abstraction that I think um, uh, leaves a bunch of other questions here. As I've said, there's some companies that would probably, uh, ISPs that probably would not be affected at all by a data retention mandate or that, that would be comfortable with it because those are their business practices already. Um, but as we move down and, and a, a see an application to a whole bunch of other applications or different business models, it can work very differently. If you provide an always-on network, uh, where users don't have a new IP address assigned every day or multiple IP addresses assigned every day, the amount of data that you're retaining if you're looking at IP address assignment data is much, much less than if you're offering, uh, as, as some, some Internet companies will assign 10 different I, IP addresses during uh, a, a user, you know, half a day of a user's logging on and off the system or using instant messaging and using... Uh, an email service provider that's uh, email service that's provided by the ISP. So even what we're talking about here is very undefined, and I think I think once we have more information, that question would be timely to to really address. David, Jim, what's the legislative outlook for this? Can you comment on that? I'm not a lobbyist. <laughs> so I can't. I do right and wrong, not uh, not figuring out Congress. Okay, sir. Let me, if I may repeat the question, the question is if we did have a federal mandate for data retention of different types of information, whatever it may be, would the legislation also um, recommend or suggest or even mandate uh, a security regime that would, would protect that data from unauthorized use or loss? Well, I, I think it certainly should, but the question is uh, how effective would that mandate be? I mean, I think we've already seen enough examples of federal agencies themselves having significant data security problems and losing control over vast amounts of personal information that has been entrusted to them. So I, I'm not sure that the government is in a particularly good position to mandate private, uh, security standards on the private sector. I think, I think the, the, the question even, it's a good question, but reveals how immature this discussion is because people have yet to come to the notion that, that data retention, if it's going to have any, any functionality, has to be made available. The data has to be made available. Uh, so you're creating a large, attractive pool of information. You're also going to have to create a way to get the information in usable form out to law enforcement. You're compounding security problems as you as you continue to do this, and so we're only just beginning to talk about it. Uh, it should probably go away entirely, but if we're if it's going to go forward, we have to talk through all these issues. 
and, and figure out the problems the data retention would create. There also are many large employers today who provide, directly provide Internet access to their employees. The federal government provides its own Internet access to uh, people accessing the Internet on federal facilities. And we've actually found in a few awful cases that um, federal employees have been downloading child pornography or engaging in, in inappropriate behavior. But the, these sorts of mandates to secure the data, to uh, make it searchable, etc., if, if this is truly going to be a solution to, um, to be able to trace people who are engaged in illegal activity online, it's supposed to be comprehensive, that the mandate logically should apply to all sorts of entities and they're going to be subject to any of these mandates um, along with the commercial ISPs. I think I had a question over here. Sir in the white shirt. Yeah. I don't Jim, have let me just repeat the question for the, the cameras. Uh, the question was, can you elaborate on the process for the existing law that requires data pres preservation and reporting? There is a provision in the, electron the Stored Communications Act, the part of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, 18 U.S.C. Section 2704, uh, 2703, by which a request is made to preserve data. Um, the data is not handed over to law enforcement in, until and unless a subpoena is received, at which point um, there, there are a bunch of proceed the ISP P, for example, could seek reimbursement of costs. Um, the, some degree of showing has been made by law enforcement. They've gone to get a subpoena. Uh, but none of those apply to simply freezing the data, to writing a letter to an ISP saying you need to, or calling an ISP saying you need to preserve this information. So this is a very, very low, easy hurdle for law enforcement to get information preserved. And then it's just waiting. Law enforcement, in many cases, later decides that it doesn't need the information. But it can ask for it and ask the data be frozen and be available to it. Um, in terms of reporting to, to uh, known incidents of illegal activity, um, there's a requirement in federal law, it was enacted in 1998, uh, that ISPs report apparent incidents of child pornography and the, report, the, the reports are, go to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which is an, almost a quasi-governmental entity that then works actively with law enforcement at both the federal and state level. And so those reports go into a single place and then are farmed out to law enforcement authorities. Um, there's some evidence, and I don't have precise numbers, that smaller ISPs aren't aware of this requirement and may not be doing the reporting that they should be doing. Um, to, to law enforcement, and uh, that's certainly an area for further study. There's a requirement by law to do so with monetary penalties. The larger ISPs do this uh, and, and are very, very serious about it and often provide uh, substantially more information to the extent they're permitted by privacy laws than is required to be provided on, in, in these reports. But um, the, the whole process of affirmatively reporting incidents of child pornography is something that um, certainly Congress could look at again and figure out how to make it perhaps apply to more entities and apply more effectively as part of a solution to the child pornography problem that we discussed earlier. Well, let me, let me just... Retention would have no effect on reporting of, of cases. It would, it, to the extent it, it was relevant, it would apply after the fact to finding um, out who logged on, you know, who, who, which, which customer does this IP address that that's, you've found, that law enforcement has found uh, actually relate to, to, to what customer does it relate. So it has no effect whatsoever on reporting, which is one of the ways that law enforcement gets information. I also just want to make the point that um, we, we can't lose sight of the fact that many of us have long felt that existing legal standards for access to a lot of the information we're talking about are exceedingly low. I mean, Jim talked about how easy it is for a law enforcement agency to order the preservation of data, but even the even the 
standard for gaining access, not just getting it preserved, but gaining access, is extremely low. I mean, there is a, a wide range of standards, many of them extremely low, that apply to different categories of information under different circumstances. But I'll give you one example. So-called pen register or trap and trace orders, uh, which allows law enforcement in real time to get header information, who's sending email to who, what websites is a particular user visiting. In real time, law enforcement can get access to that upon a, a representation to a court that the information is relevant to an investigation. They don't have to specify that the investigation even involves the person who they're looking to monitor. So I think it's important to remember that the existing regime has been subject to criticism for a long time uh, as, as being unduly easy for law enforcement to get access to a wide range of information. Well, let me just, um, if we have just one, more, one or two more questions. Um, uh, uh, the gentleman over there, then we'll go to the woman in the brown jacket. If I can just summarize the question, um, I guess the question is um, with the ability for um, users to anonymize their IP addresses and the logon information, um, would data retention be effective or is it already an op obsolete regulation because of the technology? There, there is certainly evidence that sophisticated terrorists, for example, the Al-Qaeda type terrorists who are trained, know uh, n not to use cell phones for unencrypted cell phone communications to communicate. Um, so it, it's a fair assumption that sophisticated criminals are going to find ways around this uh, method of capturing data just to, as they try to find ways around uh, other forms of surveillance today. Um, in terms of, of dumb, you know, dumb criminals who don't use those kinds of sophisticated methods, um, they, yes, there would be some more information available. The question is just that it would be available for longer. It's already available for, for the, the period that it's, the information is held commercially today, and that would be the only difference. And aside from dumb criminals or smart criminals, I, I, I try to think more about the average user. Um, and my concern is that this kind of regime is going to have a chilling effect on the Internet, that uh, the inclination to access a controversial website or search for information that might be embar personally embarrassing um, is going to be something that fewer and fewer people will want to engage in uh, because they're going to be given the sense that these activities are being uh, logged and monitored, and I, I think that's really the biggest concern, that we need to think about the average law-abiding citizen and the chilling effect that it's going to have on their use of the medium. And I'll give you a very concrete example. For, uh, if you're talking, if, you, if chat rooms are required to retain IP address assignment information, uh, employees who think that they may be in litigation with their employers over some question would be well advised not to say bad things about the employers in some chat room because those can be traced to the employee and be a justification for uh, for a firing. I'm just to give you a very specific example. So it depends, again, it depends on where this data retention mandate is applied, but if it's applied um, uh, to places where people are, are, are posting individual content, then uh, once people became aware of it, it could have a chilling effect. Returning to what I think was the, what I think was the heart of your question, data retention mandate is a lot like a lot of things I'm seeing in the in the security environment, which is which is the Maginot line, right? We do data retention. We're going to grab a lot of data. We're going to catch the nincompoops that we're probably already able to catch, and the really sophisticated folks are going to get around it. You see this in in ID cards, in data retention, and apparently we're building a. 700-mile fence across a 1,500-mile border. 
it's, the Maginot Line is what you see again and again in terms of in terms of security. Um, if you're not if you, if you're not fixing the problem, but just trying to react to it. The last question. The statute of I, I'm, I'm, I don't quite understand the question. I'm sorry. Uh, the statute of limitations would be under the law, but yeah. was violated. Well, the the first of all, the information is kept was required to be kept by 90 days. That can be extended another 90 days. So effectively, it's 180 days from, not from the time that the data was posted, but uh, from the time that, that the preservation request comes in. So it could be a good deal older than that. That data is required to be preserved. And then if law enforcement is working on an important case and they communicate with an ISP saying, hey, would you can keep this longer than 180 days, there's no uh, legal requirement absent some new requirement to destroy data which might come for ISPs to get rid of it and they can keep it longer if it's important for a law enforcement investigation. So there isn't a time at which the information is no longer available and then the statute of limitations is whatever uh, statute that law enforcement is going to use to charge somebody with an offense and that is what it is independent of the data preservation period. The, um, the contact information for all the panelists is on the inside of your program, the, um, the red, the maroon. So you, you can email any of them with additional questions. This is the last in our series on the legislating child safety. I want to thank our distinguished panel and thank you for all your great questions. Thank you.